come to unity, what to wear, what to have for breakfast, how you were getting here, maybe who you were coming with, perhaps you decided to go for a walk or meditate or read the paper or chat with a loved one, sip a cup of coffee or tea. We're constantly faced with decisions, aren't we? And I've heard in the research that, you know, the, the more decisions we need to make, the, the more our brain gets clogged up and the harder it is to make, to access our wisdom then when we need to make big decisions. <laughs> and so if you can take some of those decisions off your plate and make them more routine, it frees up some of the energy for you. So if you decide that meditation and prayer really works for you to start your morning, then you begin to make that your your ritual, your morning experience. And so you don't even have to decide it. You simply go and do it. That's what you always do. It's like muscle memory. Suddenly your body knows, I go to my special place. I sit here in, in a time of quiet, in a time of prayer. Don't even have to think about what I'm doing first in the morning. And then later in the day, when something bigger comes your way, you have that, that energy more free for you, more accessible for you. The power of wisdom is really the power of discernment. Sometimes in the 12 powers teachings, it's called the power of judgment. Um, but of course, then if we go with judgment, it gets a little confused with being judgmental. So really, we're talking about the power of discernment, of making decisions, of knowing which way to go and what to say and what to do and how to respond in any given situation. So it's, it's, we're constantly deciding both the small and the big things. And a lot of times we can think that that's just more from the mental capacity. Anybody ever write a list of pros and cons to try to make a decision? <laughs> right? So that's a mental exercise. Not a bad exercise, it's just that it's got some limitation because it doesn't have the infusion of spirit in it. Unless, as you're writing them, you're, you're connecting with this place within us, the location of wisdom, which is in the solar plexus. And so if you're connecting in that place of inward wisdom as you write them, you'll know what the energy is of each thing that you're considering. So it doesn't mean we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, the old ways, the old habits of making decisions. But what we want to be clear about is that we are turning on the power of wisdom. We are activating this innate sense within us. In the first couple of weeks of our series, we've covered the power of faith and the power of strength. So strength is the low back and, and wisdom in the solar plexus. So they're locationally close together. You know, what do people say to strengthen your, your low back? You need to strengthen your core, right? <laughs> So there's, a, there's some connection here. And certainly wisdom and with the power we'll cover next week, love. They're like twin powers. They work together in tandem quite a bit. Anybody ever made a poor decision? <laughs> yeah. We know how that feels, right? After we've made a poor decision. And usually it's because we've made a decision maybe out of fear, um, out of not enough information, too quick to act out of um, not being willing to go into the mystery of spirit, the timing of spirit, as the true wisdom keepers do. To trust that that timing and that wisdom comes at the right time, and then that's when we act. Otherwise, our actions are just sort of that. They're just actions. It's just energy used in the world, right? But if instead we wait upon the Lord, so to speak, we wait upon the Lord of our being, we wait upon that activated spiritual energy of wisdom to guide us in one direction or not. Now I say that and sometimes it's true that one step in a direction will give us a lot of information. So we don't want to be paralyzed in this place of, well, I haven't been guided, I haven't been guided, I haven't been guided, therefore I'm not doing anything. Uh, ever, <laughs> that there might be a time when we say, okay, I'm going to try this, but then I'm going to check in and see how is this going? <laughs> you know, oh, okay, this is pretty good. I seem to be in the right direction. I'm going to move a little further in this and so on. So sometimes it does take that initial bit of action 
but it's always in tandem with this spiritual dance. It's always in partnership with this, this wise being, if you will, that is within us, the divine, the Christed energy that is available to us. And of course, we're also always accessing, as we access the powers within us, we're always accessing the allness of God, right? The, the, the ever-present, permeating, all-loving presence of God is always available to us. Which is our teachings in unity are unique because we are focused on also this divine that is in us and, and to go within, not just outside, right? Jesus said, my judgment, or we could say discernment to better understand, is true for it is not I alone who discern but I and the one who sent me. So it's always in this partnership. It's not when we say I, we don't mean I in the limited sense of what, the way we think of ourselves often as just this mind or just this body or even just this heart. But it is the I, the one. I am one with the one who sent me. When I make my decisions, that's how I make them. When I discern, that's how I discern. So that's the kind of um, n not just mental capacity, but spiritual power that we're talking about, that we're accessing here. The Jesuit priest, Anthony DeMello, collected and created dialogues of sages and students. And in this one, it says that the sage says to his students, of what use is your learning and your devotions? Does a donkey become wise? through living in a library? Does a mouse become holy by hanging out in a church? Well, what is it, the students asked, then, that what, we, what do we need then? A heart, said the sage. And how do we get that, the students asked. And the sage couldn't answer because he said, what possibly could be said that the people wouldn't turn into something that had to be learned or some object of devotion? <laughs> and so it is our kind of knee-jerk reaction, isn't it, to accumulate knowledge to make us feel safer or smarter in this very mentally oriented kind of world. Or for us to... Um, begin to then worship that thing <laughs> that is kind of a little bit off the mark of what was really meant. And that's what the sage is pointing to. The sage is pointing to, how do I explain to you something that cannot be learned by having me tell you about it? How can I explain something that must be experienced directly? That is what mystical means, you know experiencing spirit directly. So it is that direct experience with wisdom, that walk through life where we directly experience and allow the wisdom of spirit to direct us in every step along the way. It becomes second nature after a while. We, it's not so pedantic. It's not so like, you know, pulled apart in this way where we're saying, okay, so we st here's the steps. We stop and we listen. You know, after a while, it just becomes a, our, our just natural for us to drop into our intuition and to respond from that place, to make decisions from that place. Do we hit the mark every time? Probably not, most of us, right? That's why we're here, <laughs> ever evolving, ever experiencing, ever growing. But to know that it is in the listening that we really come to this heart that the sage speaks of, the wise heart. So what does that listening look like? Sometimes it does begin with just a simple listening, like a really listening to one another. One man whose marriage was failing went to a master teacher and said, my marriage is, you know, it's, I'm really worried that it's going to completely fall apart. Please tell me what to do. And the master said, go home and listen to every word your wife says. And so for a whole month, he did his very best to listen to every single word his wife said. And when he went back to the master, he said, I, that's, this is what I've done. And the teacher said, okay, now go back and listen to every word she didn't say. 
because it is really in that space, right? It is in the words, but it's also in the space between the words. It is in the space between the action. It is in the space between the doing. That's where spirit is really accessed. And so it's in the, in the pause that we create. It's in the going within and breathing into spirit. It's in the slowing down that we access this true wisdom. So don't forget about the spaces and the pauses, <laughs> the places where we can really hear with our hearts and with our soul, our solar plexus. And this knowing, this place that we go, this location, this seat of, of wisdom where Charles Fillmore located it in the body in this in this solar plexus area is physically a really interesting area because there is a nerve, they call it a ganglionic nerve center, which is like a bundle of nerves that connects really behind the heart and this, this area of the gut. <laughs> so it's like, it's got this, this sort of dual power there. There's a place deep within us where all these pieces come together. These these nerves, the sense of feeling, the sense of intuition more deeply as we understand it as spirit, this combination of, of love and wisdom is accessed here. And so going literally to the place, you know, so, so what, do we, you know, what do we say in the world colloquially that actually really reflects this? I've got a gut feeling. Anybody ever say that? <laughs> Right? So, and that you do kind of get that like gut feeling, right? It's either like a, like, uh oh, or it's like, oh, yeah, this is it, right? <laughs> and so, trusting that gut feeling, then, that first response, that first knowing that this is a yes, or this is a no, or maybe it's a go or a slow, <laughs> but there is some real clarity that comes when we trust that. And, you know, I know a lot of people say, well, how do you know which, you know, voice you're hearing or feeling is, is spirit? And, you know, what's the old saying about musicians, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 right? <laughs> and so it's infinite practice. It's practicing again and again that we come to this place, that we trust this place within us. And it's over time of practicing that we trust the wisdom that is available to us. And so how do we do that? Well, it's a listening, right? It's a listening deep within. We have these gut feelings. I, I had this sense that I should turn right. And then I found out later that I avoided an accident. Anybody ever hear that or experience something like that? You know, I had a feeling I shouldn't have let my son or daughter go to that event or and I just overrode my intuition or I had a sense that I should have gone here or said this or said that and I didn't say anything or I said so much and I really know that the wise thing to do would have been to remain silent and offer just my presence. But it was out of my discomfort, my human discomfort, that I went to see my friend who was ill or who was dying and I couldn't stop talking. And later realized it was my nervousness and my discomfort that was coming out, not the wisdom of the love and the presence that I came to be. And so we have these moments of maybe even slight regret or big regret afterwards that we didn't follow that knowing that deep knowing that we already have. And so the power of wisdom, if it could ask us something, would ask us to trust it. Trust in that innate knowing that you have, that first impulse. And also to give ourselves some slack, right? <laughs> that we're always doing the best we can in any given moment. So the wisdom to forgive ourselves, to release ourselves, because otherwise then that's going to bottle up our energy and block the access that we then have to this wisdom. So keeping the energy flow open is also a part of how we maximize the power of this wisdom. Our whole body is constantly really sharing with us wisdom. The infinite wisdom of spirit is, is infused in this body. 
So every ache and every pain, every sensation, every joy, the flip of your stomach in excitement, or the sweat on your brow, or the the sense of nervousness in your maybe in your hands that the, maybe you get sweaty palms or the flush of your cheeks or the tightness in your shoulders or the open and and joy that you might feel in any given moment all of that is communication with the unseen communication with the mystery our bodies are simply a vehicle for that divine intelligence how else could this magnificent structure have been created that heals itself. You know, living with a five-year-old, I'm reminded again and again of the, the miracle of the body as we talk about sores and scabs and wounds and how they heal and why you shouldn't pick them because you're letting, you know, the, the wisdom of spirit, the love of spirit heal as it does, as it knows how. Get out of the way, Right? Don't pick at those wounds. Get out of the way. <laughs> and let the body's intelligence heal what it knows to heal. Let the body's wisdom reveal what it needs to reveal. And it's not the body like the limit, limited idea we have of the body, but the body temple. It's the, it's the permeable spirit. It's the truth of who we are that comes through every cell of our bodies. And sometimes bypassing the mental capacity is actually helpful because in this intuitive sort of gut feeling way, it doesn't mean that we don't use these capacities, but that gives us sort of the essential, you know, the, the really primal almost knowing and truth. And it's then from there that we can use the mental capacities to begin to unwind our actions. So it's not to th throw that out again, but it's, it's, it's to trust this, this gut, this, this sense. So how do, we, how do we really know, though? How do we, people say, how do I discern that? How do I discern that feeling? Or how do I discern that? Because sometimes I think the thing that gets in the way the most for us is fear, right? Sometimes fear comes in. And then it's hard to know because maybe this direction is a yes, but I'm afraid, <laughs> I've got those, you know, that net of butterflies going, another sensation that tells us something, that's wisdom speaking to us, divine wisdom speaking to us directly. So we might need to then check in with that and be with that and let that fear begin to dissipate, embrace that fear and let it begin to dissipate so that we can then open it once again to the question at hand. It helps if you ask your body, you ask your wisdom, you ask the, the innate divinity, divine wisdom within you, questions that can be answered in yes or no to begin to practice. So I invite you just to take a moment so that you can feel, and maybe you know it well, but you can revisit then, what is a yes in my body? Just take a moment to feel what a yes feels like really reverberate yes I feel a yes and this is how my body feels and now let's feel a no what does no feel like no I'm getting the answer no how does that feel in your body what happens in your body what's the sensation in your body no. Where does it show up in your body? No. And now let's go back to yes. Let's feel yes again. What does yes feel like? What does it look like in your body? What does it feel like? How, what are the sensations? The yes. And I know every body is different, but I imagine there's maybe some similarities. When I say yes, when I feel yes inside of me, it feels expansive. It feels open. It feels relaxed. When I hear no in my body, it feels constricted. I usually feel a little constriction through here and then maybe even sometimes some tightness in my neck. So 
work with that subtlety in your own prayer time. Use simple, small questions to ask your body and begin to exercise this muscle of divine wisdom. And as you do so, then you bring that out into the world and for every decision that needs to be made, you have this innate understanding of that's a yes, <laughs> that's a no. I'm moving in this direction. I'm stopping now and pausing until I can work through what feels like fear. So I asked you a while back, did you ever make a poor decision? When I was in grade school, my uh, brownie troop and some of the girls in the brownie ter- troop and I decided it was a good idea when we had some downtime to run across the gym- gymnasium and jump over the balance beam. And when I jumped, my foot got stuck underneath the beam. And, and that wasn't really a bad decision because I was just being a kid playing, but it was as I was falling that I made a really bad decision. See, my f- best friend, Julie McGill, had recently fallen when we were roller skating and she braced her fall with her arms and she broke her arm. So I decided I wasn't going to break my arm and I pinned my arms to my side. And so I broke my fall with my front teeth. Yeah. (laughs) Not the wisest choice I ever made. But I tell you, I have a constant reminder as an adult because I don't have my full teeth. (laughs) I have a constant reminder of the power of, of listening to instinct, to intuition, to that innate knowing in us that does have the answers. I know when we look at these, you know, big decisions that are happening in our world, I know a lot of us feel powerless. And we are never powerless because there is strength in our unity and there is infinite strength in our oneness And there is divine intelligence that permeates every cell of life. Every little plant and insect is made of that divine intelligence. And there is a a kind of reverberation to the yes and a constriction to the no. We know what gives life. We know the right answers in how to treat one another with dignity, with kindness, with love, with a sense of welcome. We know this. All of us, all of us know this. That's why you remember when we did the Braving the Wilderness work of Brene Brown, that um, she talks about how it's a process of, because we all have this wiring, this, this innate knowing of the way to treat each other, the sense of, of dignity and kindness that is just built into our being. That's how these atrocities happen is by kind of tricking our minds by creating groups of people that we decide are subhuman in some way. And we start creating a whole false idea about a group of people. And we keep putting that out there until our minds sort of fall into this sleepy idea that this might be true. Or there's some parts of us that are, are, that we are rejecting, that we project onto others. And pretty soon we have a created an atrocity, a genocide, or something like it. And so we have the divine wisdom, and all of us who are attuned to that divine wisdom, it is our, our work. Charles Fillmore would talk about the absolute necessity and urgency, really, of regenerating ourselves, of activating each of these 12 power centers so we can be that in the world that we came to be. And so it is the divine wisdom within us that as we practice in these small matters of everyday decision making in our individual lives, that we are then practiced in the larger matters of what is mine to do. And the knowing of the power of prayer, the power of how we, when we unite as one in that space of oneness, even in our grief, even in our grief, because that too, what is grief but the expression of love? And so touching that very power of love through our innate knowing, our innate understanding of our wisdom, we give out to the people who are in need all over the world. Every immigrant and every refugee can feel the power of our prayers, the knowing of our love and activate the wisdom within themselves to navigate the difficult space they now find themselves in. 
And so there's no thing that, no thing, literally no thing that is really too big for us because we're never alone. This is a truth we always know, that we are one with all of life. And so that means that all the undesirable characteristics we see out there in the world are also part of the oneness, part of the working out, part of the contrast of being a human on the planet at this time. But there is a feeling, a knowing, a power that prevails, and that is the power of divine wisdom that is everywhere present. In every breath, we have the power to connect with that sense of innate knowing. Dr. Brazelton, his full name is Dr. T. Barry Brazelton. He was a pediatrician and he had, um, he wrote many books also on child development. One day he was in the grocery store and he saw a mom and her child having a hard time. The child was crying, the mother was swatting at the child. Every time the mother swatted at the child, the crying got worse. And so this went on and on. And as you can imagine, they were just kind of locked in this dynamic that wasn't working. And Dr. Brazelton said, I wanted to go over there and pin that mother's, you know, hands to her side and tell her to stop. <laughs> he said, but I stopped myself and I said, what do I know? What do I know about mothers and children? What do I know about parents and children? And it was from that knowing that he then approached and said to the mother, it's really hard to get shopping done when you've got to bring a little one everywhere, isn't it? And she looked at him sort of incredulously for a minute. And then she just sank down onto the floor and started to sob. By then the child had stopped crying and the child crawled into her mother's lap and put her arms around her. And they melted into love. <laughs> because a bystander followed the wisdom within him to stop himself and say, what do I know? And then to act from that knowing, to speak from that knowing. What do you know? I'm going to bet that every one of us knows a whole lot more than we ever give ourselves credit for. We know. We know that we know. We know how to act in any moment. We know what to say in any moment. It's all right there for the taking, for the using, for the speaking, for the movement upon the earth. But we won't go there if we don't pra get practiced at trusting the wisdom of the body temple where we are encoded <laughs> with this divine wisdom or giving out our prayers to the allness of God when we just need help and then letting those two dynamics of the innate and, and the overarching divinity of the planet interact with one another and give us that yes or that no, that go or that slow, say this, say that. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs, wisdom says, happy is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors, for whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But those who don't find me, they injure themselves. Some of us aren't finding wisdom. Some of us are finding wisdom. All of us need to find wisdom <laughs> because it's here. It's not that hard. We make it hard. We complicate things. So it is in the, in the energy of golden sunlight <laughs> that our answers are so clear and that golden sunlight is in you. <laughs> Mary Oliver said this in one of her writings, 
I have decided to find myself a home in the mountains, somewhere high up where one learns to live peacefully in the cold and the silence. It's said that in such a, cert a place, certain revelations may be discovered that what the spirit reaches for may eventually be felt, if not exactly understood. Slowly, no doubt. I'm not talking about a vacation. Of course, at the same time, I mean to stay exactly where I am. Are you following me? Are you following me? Are you following me? That's what Spirit says over and over again. We just get so distracted and busy with all the noise, we don't hear that question. But it is the question of our lives, it's the question of our times, it's the question of every movement and step, every thought, every word, every action. Are you following me? Are you following me? Mary Oliver is not going somewhere physically up in the mountains. She's saying, I mean to go there by staying exactly where I am. What is she saying? I'm activating the power of wisdom so that I can access the spiritual truths. And listen, and listen, are you following me? Yes, <laughs> she might answer to that question. The great wisdom keepers know the mystery of spirit, trust it, trust that timing. And so it is in our busy world of act and do and now and faster that we often forget that sometimes it's slow and steady that wins the race. <laughs> and that that wisdom comes to us when it is the right time. So trusting in that timing, be still and know that I am. Know that I am God, the psalmist said. Be still and know that I am. That's how we follow. That's how we respond to that question, are you following me? So do you want to be wise? <laughs> Wiser, because you already are. And to know that wisdom within us, it's just practicing, it's just slowing down, it's just trusting, it's going within, it's listening, listening, listening. We are this power of divine wisdom, and we are guided constantly in every thought, in every word, in every action. Let's know that together. Let's speak that knowing together. I am guided by divine wisdom in every thought, word and action. I think there's a slide there, you know. Let's say that together. I am guided by divine wisdom in every thought, in every word, in every action. And so it is.